But I know what a lot of you are thinking. You're probably thinking, gee whiz, I, I thought I was rid of that guy. <laughs> I was gone last week, here for a long time, then last week you show up, and I'm not here today. Finally, I mean, you're another, I'm thinking I'm gone, but no, I'm back. So, since you're torture, I'm back. So, uh, thank you all for coming. The night's class is on Bhagavad Gita, as it is, 18th chapter. We're going to go with the 61st, 61st verse, 61, 62, and 63. Uh, <clears throat> now, I don't like to think of this as a lecture. I think I hope all of you know this by now. But <clears throat> I'm going to do some reading. <coughs> But I want us to, to talk, you know, so please stop me at any time. But, uh, anything you have to say, any questions or comments, okay? So please feel free to do so. Otherwise, people will just have to, you're listening to me, and that's, that's not fair to anybody. So we want to know what you're thinking. So we're going to cover some topics. Uh, we only have a uh, half hour, which is best. So I'm going to skip some skip Sanskrit. I'm going to skip some of the purports and get down to the, the meat of it, and uh, if we have time, we'll do more. Uh, people often talk about, uh, well, God is within. Does everybody believe that? Is yeah. God in your heart? Uh -huh. Yeah. God is there. Uh -huh. Christian theology uh, refers to that Godhead as uh, the Holy Spirit. In Sanskrit, he's called the Paramatma, the super soul, supreme soul. So we're situated here in our heart, the region of the heart, and God, the super soul, the Paramatma, is situated next to us, like two birds sitting on a limb of a tree. Okay? So Krishna and Arjuna are having this discussion about what should what should one do if he wants to achieve perfection. Okay? So this is, we're going to pick up right there. <clears throat> Krishna says, The Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjuna, and is directing the wanderings of all living entities who are seated as on a machine made of material energy. Now Krishna knows that he is the Supreme Lord Godhead, but he's saying that the Supreme Lord is situated within you. You see? So... In everyone's heart. And he's saying that this is like um, sitting next to someone who's the driver of this material world who's like a machine. Your body is like a machine, you see. And it, as you will, the Supreme Lord is carrying out your desire, you see. So um, let's go on to the next verse. Krishna says, O sign of Bartha. Surrender unto him utterly. By his grace, you will, you will attain transcendental peace and the supreme and eternal abode. So Krishna is saying, if you surrender to this supreme super soul, the supreme Godhead, that you will attain eternal peace, transcendental eternal peace in the eternal abode. You see, if you do so, if you'll surrender. Srila Prabhupada says in the purport, <clears throat> living entity should therefore surrender unto the first supreme personality of Godhead, who is situated in everyone's heart, and that will re relieve him from all kinds of miseries of this material existence. By such surrender, not only will one be released from all miseries of this life, but at the end he will reach the supreme God, the transcendental world, is described in the Vedic literatures in Rig Veda 122.20 as Pad Vishnu Paramam Padam. Since all of creation is the kingdom of God, everything material is actually spiritual. But Padam, uh, Paramam Padam specifically refers to the eternal world, which is called the spiritual sky or like now, this is, this is an interesting statement. Since all of creation is the kingdom of God, everything material is actually spiritual. 
Have you ever thought about that? Everything material is actually, is actually spiritual because it's God's energy. Huh? But what's the difference between this material energy, which is God's energy, and spiritual energy? What is the difference? Anybody know? The material energy cannot, cannot function without the spiritual energy. Exactly. And the material energy is temporary. The spiritual energy is permanent. Yes, sir. We can't hear what you said. Could you repeat what you said out, out loud? Can I say what? <laughs> the material energy, I mean the physical body, cannot function without the spiritual energy, like your soul inside your inside this body is it can function is alive but when the soul leave the physical body is nothing so like so for, for example material energy can't function this this body is made of the five material elements earth water fire air and ether so uh, there's nothing special about it except it has you in that body when you enter into that body, now the body becomes special. It can walk, it can talk, create, think. You see, the difference between a live body and a dead body is the presence of the soul. So the soul is the attractive part of the body. So, and you can prove this to yourself. If you can think of someone who's a very attractive person, very, very beautiful, very beautiful features and um, bodily features and everything. Boy, he's such a beautiful person. You may want to embrace that person. You may think, oh, I would like to hug him. He's so beautiful. All right, what if that person was dead? Same body. Is it embraceable now? Not so attractive, is it? No matter who it is, no matter how uh, attractive that person might have been, when the soul is present, when the soul leaves, what's the attraction? You see what I mean? The only difference is the presence of the soul. No one can tell. If the scientists can analyze a dead body and a living body, and it's the same, the same chemical analysis. There's nothing different, you see, except the soul. The soul is there. When the soul is there, the body becomes attractive. You know? It's like if you have a beautiful cat or a wonderful favorite dog or some pet. But as soon as the soul leave, it leaves and that body is dead, what's the attraction? You see? Now it's time to do what? Right. Dispose of the body properly. Let's do something with it. Burn it, bury it, whatever. But we certainly don't want to leave, a, leave it around very long. You see, not at room temperature. You know? So, the attractive feature of the body is the living entity. So, we have to meditate on that. We shouldn't see each other as bodies. We should see each other as eternal spirit souls, including ourselves. We are an eternal spirit soul, an eternal living entity. We're not this temporary body. See? So you may think, well, gosh, if I'm eternal, wow, what have I been doing for eternity? <laughs> you know, my body's, you know, like my body's very young. I'm only 65, so you know, I don't know about the rest of it, but I'm, I'm really young. <laughs> so I can't think of anything beyond that. I can't remember beyond my, before my childhood. So where was I? If, I was, if I'm eternal, where was I? What was I up to all this time? You see? And, and if I'm eternal, where will I go? What will happen to me? How will I manifest when this body is finished? And we all know that this body will finish. Mother of a son, you're a doctor, right? Okay. So you should be expert on answering this question. What is the death rate of human beings? 100%. 100%. Now that's not my speculation. She's qualified. 
<laughs> my doctor tells me that I, I don't have a chance to live eternally. This body won't live forever. So the death rate of this planet has always been 100%. Everything that's ever taken birth has died. So the souls are coming and going. It's like a revolving door. Souls are leaving, souls are coming. I'm, I'm, I'm giving up this body. It will turn back into the material elements. It'll be dust. Dust to dust. So another soul comes and another body will form. Could be a squirrel or, or a cockroach or a snake or whatever. Human being, you see? So, if I'm eternal, I've been somewhere <coughs> doing something. So, the Vedas tell us that my nature as an eternal living entity is sat chit ananda. Sat means eternal. I'm eternal. Chit, I am full of knowledge. I know everything. And ananda, I'm full of bliss. That is my eternal nature. So, now, we may think, but if that's my eternal nature, I'm not feeling that right now. I don't feel eternal. You know, I feel the body changing all the time. Uh, you know, these bodies are always changing. I was talking to my Kama Prabhu a couple of days ago over lunch, and we were talking about these bodies just change. You know, all of a sudden, we have a new calamity. You know, the body won't sleep. You know, sometimes my body just won't sleep. It just won't, and I'm dead tired of it. It won't. So we're going through these, constantly going through these changes. So I'm such cheap and ananda. How is it that I'm always blissful if I'm plagued by the problems in, of this body? It's proof. I am not this body. I am not the body. I am the eternal living entity, full of knowledge and full of bliss. I am eternally blissful, except when I identify with this body. As soon as I start to believe that I am this body and that I have a place in this world, then I'm open to so many miseries and so much suffering. You see? The opportunity to escape suffering is to identify yourself with who you really are. This is called self-realization. You come to the point where you know who you are. I am an eternal living entity. What is my activity? What do I do for eternity? There's only one activity for the soul, and that's to be servant of God. That is our function. That's what living entities do. Now you may say, well, you know, I haven't been really doing a lot of that lately. <laughs> Some of us, you know, sometimes I feel like I don't, I'm not doing hardly any service whatsoever, you see. But because I'm identifying with this body, I've forgotten my true constitutional position. I'm thinking I'm a this or I'm a that. I have this position in life and whatever. I'm convinced that I'm a human being. My last life I was convinced that I was a dog. In my next life I might be convinced that I'm a worm, you see. But none of that is true. I'm an eternal living entity and it's by nature to be happy. But I can be happy only if I come to the realization that A, I am not this body, I'm an eternal living entity, and B, my only function is to please the Supreme Lord. You see? Now you may think, well, wait a minute. Time out here. Please the Supreme Lord. What about me? When do I get some of this pleasure? That's how we get pleasure. Getting we get. Huh? Speaking that you're so sure that you're an eternal uh, being, how can you prove that? Who say that you say that you're an eternal being is more right than someone else and say, oh, I'm just human that's here for a period of time and I'm not? Well, I have to accept the authority of Krishna and the previous acharyas, those realized souls who have brought this science to me. You see? How can I prove that I'm eternal? Well, I can't prove it to you. How can you prove that I'm not? Exactly. Well, so, so it's it requires it's what? Nothing, so it's not, nothing for certain. Huh? There's nothing for certain. It's enigma. 
nobody knows. Nobody knows about what it actually the soul, if the soul is gone, if the revolving door, whatever you say. Nobody However, knows. that's true, but that's like saying well, nobody knows how to fix a computer. That's not true. Because that's I don't true. know how to fix a computer. Well, yeah. nobody knows. I don't know how to be a doctor, so I'm, I don't think anybody does. You see? Because I don't know it, because I haven't proven it to myself by accepting um, direction from someone who does know, who then that? I think I don't know. Who's that? God? Huh? Who's that? God? God? God's representative. He you says, have a meeting with him? Huh? You had a meeting with him? Have I had a meeting with God's representative? Yes. Yes. He's sitting right there. When he was on the planet. Or the Sundali, we, had, we were directed by them. My top level group is life. You see. Now, you may say, I don't know about this, though. I, I want proof. Well, is it proof that you can see? You want proof you can see? No, I can see. Uh huh? If you have proof you can see, your eyes can be tricked. You see, there are so many illusions. I can show you something that looks one way. And then we may actually think it's something else. You see what I mean? So we can't trust our senses. They're imperfect. I can't trust my eyes. I have a tendency to speculate. And right now, I'm in the darkness of ignorance. You see? So I have to admit that I don't know. So if I don't know, then I'm not an authority. So if I admit I'm not an authority, then I have to find someone who is an authority. Well, someone who knows. Because I want to know. It's my nature to know. My nature is such ananda. Knowledge is what, we, what, what drives us. We want to know. I mean, if I could just curl up and maybe have some intoxication and some sense gratification, then maybe for a while I, for, I can forget that I want to know this. And that's what happens to most of us in life. At some time in our life, we start out, on a quest to answer these questions, usually when we're young, you know, late uh, high school, early college, or somewhere in college years, we start to, for, for a lot of people, from, for some people it comes later, for some earlier, but we want to know what answers to these questions. Who am I? What is this world of, that I'm in? What is my relationship to this world? Who is God? What's he like? What does he want from me? We have all these questions, but unfortunately, we don't get the answers from the proper people. So then we get covered over with so many other things, and we get distracted in eating, sleeping, mating, defending. In other words, we become just like the animals. They're only thinking about eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. But the human being can actually wonder, who am I? Am I eternal? Am I gonna, when I die, do just the lights go out? And that's it? You see, the human being is different from the animals in that his brain will allow him to ask these questions. If we don't ask these questions, then what are we like? The animals. If the animal is simply... Huh? We can be more than animals. Look, that's what I said. Be spiritual and be thinking. And not necessarily believe that there is... But what does spiritual mean? What does that spiritual God. mean? What does it mean to be spiritual? Be good to someone else. Be spiritual. Animals are good to one another. Sometimes they're good to their master. They're... Well, what's so the being, about animals? Being good. Why is it a comparison between humans to animals? The animals are better because of their master? The animals are limited in that they cannot inquire who is God. And what about me? What happens at the time of death? The human beings are able to do that. My point is that if we don't pursue that, then we're behaving like an animal. Even if we're good. We can be good just because we're not mean. Doesn't mean we're spiritual. You see? Even nasty, demonic type people are good some of the time. You know, Adolf Hitler was in love. Someone was in love with him. They were born loved him. You see what I mean? He was good. He had 
pet dogs. They loved him. He was good to them. So was he being spiritual when he was being good to his, his dogs and his friends and his, uh, his lover? And he was unspiritual when he was doing the stuff that he was doing? Is that is, is spiritual something you do for a while and then you put it away and then you go on about being unspiritual? Well, huh? spiritual is a full-time job. It's a full-time pursuit. And when we have questions, we just seek out those who have the answers. This is like if I want to learn trigonometry. It's hard to even say that word. <laughs> Especially say it a whole bunch of times fast. You're trying to, you know. So I can't figure out, you know, the sine of the, the cosine of the square root of the, you know. But there are people who can sit down and say, well, look, let me show you. This angle equals this and such and such, blah, blah, blah. And you say, hey, I think I'm getting this. But before it looked really ridiculous. I'm thinking this is impossible, you see. So because we don't know, doesn't mean that, well, if I don't know, I'm just going to go on not knowing. Some people can say, I don't know, and I don't care, and I'm just going to go on with my life. I don't know. Many people can't. So people in spiritual pursuit, those who are trying to advance spiritually, can't do without the answers. You see, they Maybe pursue they the answers. They know that they're going to die one day. It's very sad to think about it, that you're going to die one day. It's not so sad. It is. No. Some people it is. Not sad and at all. And you can think of, yeah, you live all your life, you work all your life, you have kids, you have everything, and you have to apart from it. All of it. It's going to be very sad. I think about everything it's okay. But it's, it's at the sad. same time... It's sad on the material platform. I think people come up with all the idea of God and all these other faces. It's because... That's my idea. Yes, that's, that's my idea. idea. Yeah, I'm, but it actually I'm people, coming from religious background that, in a way, not like Orthodox. And people like pursue. That, but I came to that point that I think that people, and it's okay. If well, I'm confident in it, some people might look challenge. for confidence. That's true. Huh? But some people are looking for bliss. It's my nature to be blissful, and I want it. If, it, if, I have an, if I'm entitled to be blissful, then I want it. Now, when we're not feeling blissful, Dr. Like Aaron and I were talking about this earlier today, when I'm not feeling blissful, then I interpret that feeling as suffering. When I'm suffering, I'm not suffering. It's just the absence of bliss. It's just like when you're cold, there's no such thing as cold. Albert Einstein explained that. There's no way to measure cold. You measure heat. Cold is the absence of heat. There's no way to measure darkness. There's no such thing as darkness. You measure light. And when it's darker, you're, you're absent light. When it's completely pitch black, that means there's no light. You see? So when you're feeling suffering, you're interpreting that as suffering. Really, you're just away from the bliss. What, what does the bliss come from? Bliss comes from the source of everything, which is God. Okay, let me read this last verse and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Last verse, Krishna says here, Thus I've explained to you knowledge, still more confidential. Deliberate on this fully, and then do what you wish to do. So this is very important. Krishna's not twisting arms. He's not saying, hey, buddy, you better get with the program or you know, I'll deal with you. Krishna's not saying that. He said, this I've given to you, this information, most confidential knowledge, deliberate on it carefully, and then do as you wish. In other words, you have free will. You can decide, you know what, Krishna, I'm not, I'm not going to buy this. I'm going to swallow any of this, you know? I don't know. I, I think I can just kind of go out and I can figure out my own way. What do I need this for? Somebody reading out of a book? You know, how do I know where the book came from? I'm just going to do it my own way. You see, if you want to roll the dice and try to do that, 
how many people say that? You know, that if you're going to go someplace, most people have smartphones or computers or something. What are you going to do if you have to if you have to find 26 East Oracle Avenue and you're new in town? <coughs> you're going to take out your phone and you're going to Google it or put it in and get directions. Why? Because you're intelligent. But now you could just wander around Tucson and ultimately you would find it. Maybe. <laughs> After many tanks of gas, you know, and getting really angry, you know, asking some directions and maybe somebody gave you directions, you went on the other side of town and you didn't remember, whatever, but you just Google. We go to Google. Google seems to know everything. <laughs> but I'm not going to approach God, the source of Google. You know, was, everything comes from God. God. The definition of God is the source of, of everything, that from which everything emanates. You see? So I'll have faith in Google. <laughs> I mean, you see it on the internet, it's got to be true, right? I have faith in Google. I don't know how it works. I don't have a clue what happens. Somewhere it goes, it goes from my keyboard out there somewhere, and then this information comes back, and I say, oh, the truth. So I'm having this relationship with my God that I carry around in my pocket, and I call my smartphone. Which is way smarter than me. But yet I'm going to hesitate to have some surrender to God. Why? Because what if God has a, dare I say, personality? What if there's a God that could ask me to do something? Google's not going to ask me to do anything. I don't even have to follow these silly directions. I can go another way if I want to. See? But if there is a God, and that God has a personality, and, and that God can ask me to do something, it's possible that that God can ask me to do something that I don't want to do. And therefore, I don't know if I want to get that close to it. I think I'll rely on Google. I can just type in heaven, and Google will tell me how to get there. <laughs> If I don't want to go, I don't have to. So, um, I think there may be some discussions or questions. I welcome them. Uh, let's eat together. If you have questions, I'm going to sit somewhere over here. Please join and let's, let's have more conversation. But uh, we have to wrap it up right now because we have bigger and better things to go through. So, thank you so much for coming.